And it's the classic, you know, mailed fist behind the velvet glove, right? Which yeah. is, you know, as uh, Judge Willett says during the oral argument, nice little social media company here be too bad if something happened to it, uh, you know, because the antitrust enforcers got uh, They compared them to the mob. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's it's exactly what it is, right? It's the Which mob. Is, it's the mob. They you don't, don't have, have to say it to you. Yeah, right. They don't have to say it. They don't even have to follow through, right? Um, they they ju you just have to know that they might follow through, right? And that's what they can do with these things, right? Well, here's my here's my favorite new quote. Have you heard about uh, Uncle Earl Long? Uh huh. You know the, he's the corrupt. He's the brother of Huey Long. Yeah, right. In Louisiana. He once said, don't write anything you can phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't phone anything you can talk. Right. Don't, don't talk anything when you can whisper. Right. Don't whisper anything when you can smile. Right. Don't smile anything you can nod. And don't nod anything you can wink. Right. <laughs> right. Right. The Bill Walton Show, August 16th. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists, and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics, and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. We often talk about the need for the rule of law, but not very often do we really get into why it really matters. And adherence to the rule of law is essential for economic growth and especially personal liberty. The rule of law, consistently and fairly applied, affords a clear legal landscape so that we can make plans and have confidence that we can carry them out. The rule of law enables us to anticipate other people's behavior, especially government officials, so that we can pursue our individual ends, whatever they may be. Yet, the rule of law is in steep decline in the United States, and perhaps no more so than in a field I spent most of my career in, uh, the rule of law in finance and banking. This sounds like a boring topic, but it is not. Financial regulation is unusually convoluted and secretive, and it affects you every single day. And in particular, and we'll be talking about here, this here, is that the clash between the rule of law and the coercive regulatory state affects every one of us, but most of us are not even aware it's occurring. So with great fanfare, I'd like to bring in my guest, Todd Zwicky, returning guest, great friend, great friend of liberty, especially professor at George Mason's Kalia Rule of Law, who's written a terrific piece called Restoring the Rule of Law and Finance. Uh, Todd's been back here many times. Last time he was here with Janine Yunus, we were talking about Missouri v. Biden, where it looks like we, so far, uh, looks like we might get it through appeals and have a win. And Todd's also talked to us about bringing, uh, uh, what, do we, what do we call that? So Chinese-style social credit. <laughs> uh, we'll be coming to America, and we're also going to get into uh, central bank digital currencies today. And... Uh, how alarming they are and what we need to do about it. So, Todd, uh, welcome. Thanks, Bill. And uh, you've got a new gig. You're going out to uh, to uh, to uh, Boulder. That That's right. Uh, I'm going to be the visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy for the Bruce Benson Center um, uh, for the study of Western civilization at the University of Colorado so, Boulder so, for so, this fall. So, so Boulder, that would make you their diversity hire for the year. I think that I think that would. <laughs> That's right. That's right. My my Birkenstocks are in the mail from Amazon. Uh, so. <laughs> and you're going to be teaching about the rule of law. I'll be teaching two classes, one on the rule of law, uh, the history, the theory and the implications. And then I'm going to be teaching a class on Hayek and his critics, uh, which, given Hayek's centrality to the rule of law debate in uh, the last century in particular, um, obviously these topics will be front and center in that class also. So let's get into the rule of law and finance. I mean, we're going to wander into, I think, a lot of different things. But look, can you give me just the, you give us just the uh, the gist of why we ought to be concerned? Sure. The rule of law in finance is important for two reasons, as you suggested in your your introduction, which is first. It's the cornerstone of economic liberty. Um, Ayn Rand once said uh, you could think of money as a form of frozen energy. 
uh, which is it's sitting there to be unleashed for creative powers and economic growth. Uh, um, but to be able to make loans, to be able to get capital uh, in the economy, you need to be able to rely on contracts. You need to be able to rely on the fact that contracts will be enforced, uh, that the government won't act arbitrarily to take your property or rewrite, uh, rewrite contracts, because um, uh, finance requires investments over long periods of time. Um, 10, 20, 30 year bonds, you know, even the things like that. And so um, to the extent that uh, finance, access to capital, access to banking services is essential for economic freedom and economic growth, um, the rule of law, perhaps more than any other industry, is uh, the center of that. But the second thing is, is the rule well, of law. Well, otherwise, it's yeah. like playing any kind of board game with no rules. Yeah, that's and you right. Can't, you can't get from here to there unless you know what the parameters are and a businessman, and I've been in this mode deploying capital. If you don't know what's going to be the law five years from now, you can't deploy capital now. That's and, exactly and, and you right. You look at economic growth in the countries throughout the world; those that have a firm, firmer rule of law have much faster economic growth than those that don't. Yeah, exactly right. Because you you need it in order to be able to make investments. A good example is, if you recall back to the financial crisis of two thousand eight, when the government um, uh, bailed out the auto companies. And in particular in Chrysler, if you recall, the government kind of came in and um, for the benefit of the UAW, um, plundered the uh, pre-existing secured creditors in that case um, and forced them to take less than they were entitled to. What's interesting about that that illustrates the point, Bill, is that after that, economic studies found that debt contracts changed that if you were going to lend to um, a company in industry, particularly one that was heavily unionized, um, you demanded a risk premium that you did not previously demand precisely because of the new political risk associated with the fact that the government might take an interest in the, the investment and intervene to help out some uh, well, well, um, politically well, favored Well, let me put this in, in plain English, you know, as a former deal guy. Basically, you make a loan to Chrysler. And you say to Chrysler, I'll give you the money, but I want a security interest in your assets. And that gives me collateral for my loan. So even though it's a risky credit, I'm okay because I know I've got enough assets to cover it if I've got to liquidate. Right. So what the government did here on be at the behest of the, uh, of the labor unions is they said, secured creditors, sorry, you don't have that security interest. Right. You're just floating out there unsecured. And moreover, you're not only going to get not get your money back or not get your collateral, you're not going to get most of your money back. Right. That's what the government did. That's right. And that has an impact, which is studies <laughs> yeah, found that going does. forward. All of a then, sudden, all of a sudden, you're wondering why you want to put money into any automobile yeah, company. Yeah, Wall Street may be greedy, but they're not stupid, right? <laughs> After that, basically, you're going to charge higher interest rates uh, before you lend to those uh, those industries uh, and the like. And that illustrates the importance of, of firm contractual obligations, firm reliable uh, um, um, uh, regulatory environment and, and the like. Um, but... But the rule of law in finance is important for a second reason, right, which is it's important for individual liberty. Um, and, you know, one of the examples I give in this is um, that we'll come back to is this this new problem of debanking. Um, well, emerging problem of the past few years that I've been sounding the alarm about and we've talked about previously, which is this idea of banks taking away people or organizations financial um, their, their bank accounts for um uh, for political reasons. Um, and this really started during the Obama administration under the Operation Choke Point Initiative, where they targeted completely legal industries, such as firearms dealers, payday lenders, so-called uh, sellers of so-called racist materials, um, and basically went to the banks and said, um, it's a reputation risk to deal, to, to deal with companies in these industries. Um, and so they lost access to uh, to bank accounts. Now this the, the has happened to others. The industries were pawn shops, gun dealers, gun dealers, pay, they also, payday lenders, payday lenders. They also said things like quote racist materials unquote uh, um, uh, and the like. Notably, they did not include say abortion clinics, uh, environmental groups, yeah. uh, and the like. So it's clearly a political uh, list. But what I think is so striking about that that goes beyond just the financial uh, issue is. Essentially, what they were doing, they, they couldn't, you can't take, a, you, you couldn't pass a law that prohibited, you know, uh, gun dealers or 
racist uh, um, uh, companies, right, or racist people, because the First and Second Amendment would prevent it. But what we're seeing now is they can use this leverage of the uh, of the financial system to stifle dissent, to essentially, in that example, take away First and Second Amendment rights. Because if you can't have a bank account, you can't really have a company that sells stuff uh, um, to, to, to the public. And so it provides a way of, you know, they called it Operation Choke Point for a reason, which is, they said the financial system is very the choke rare, point. Very rarely do they name something so accurately. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But that shows the way in which um, individual liberty is threatened. Our yeah. constitutional rights are indirectly threatened. Well, they threatened. just did this with Mike Lindell. Exactly. And they did it with, uh, who was the governor of Kansas that he ran? Uh, Sam Brownback yeah. um, had a uh, religious liberties organization uh, that I believe it was Chase. Uh, I may, it, I was, it was Chase. It was Chase said, My good um, buddy, Jamie we want to know what you're doing. We yeah. want to know who your donors are going to be. We want to know, uh, you know who you're going to donate to. Uh, all these sorts of things um, before we will give you a bank account, right? Um, and so this this shows the 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 threat here, right? Now, do we know for sure that the administrative state and the government is behind it? Um, no, but that gets to the question of how exactly the government is exercising its power. Well, in these we areas. were we were talking about this before we got started. Here was it the you know you and I go back a long way as libertarians and the and the. The paradigm really was okay. They're the private actors, the the hardy entrepreneurs, right. the John Galts right. of the world, and they're off making what creating wealth. And then you've got the predatory government, and they're trying to shut companies down, take them over, make them you know do 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 socially good things on their at right. their behest. Well, now we're seeing a very different landscape. You know, the big banks in particular, and a lot of the big multinational companies. Their their political agenda <laughs> has has become aligned with uh, with a lot of the government, a lot of the federal agencies. So we used to think just in terms of regulators. Now at Chase, you don't know whether some some person in their Department of Community Affairs who was a progressive said we ought to shut uh, shut shut uh, shut brand back down. That's that's and that's what I think is the important question for those of us who are libertarians and conservatives to confront, which we've had this. By the so, way, I think everybody should be. And everybody should. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> okay. But we've had this kind of very useful binary view of the world for centuries, really, yeah. which is the private sector is not only neutral toward liberty, but private sector competitive markets is promotion of liberty. And so allowing private sector companies to decide who to deal with. Promotional liberty, what do you mean? Uh, that, that it actually furthers liberty okay. to basically allow well, yeah. uh, companies to, 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 to be able to do this, where the public sector then is the only real threat to, uh, to, to liberty. But what you put your, fi put your finger on and what you know, I've been sort of sounding the bell on for the last uh, several years is in the world of the modern administrative state, that binary is no longer valued, uh, is no longer completely accurate. Right. So you gave the example of Chase, but you think about Chase or Citibank or Bank of America to I don't know what you call those, but to call those just a private company, you know, especially like, after Dodd Frank. Yeah. Especially after Dodd Frank, like, you know, Sal's butcher shop on the corner or, you know, Sally's beauty supply, you know, on Main Street, whatever those are to call them a private business is an abuse of the English language. Right. They are some amalgam of public private under the thumb of the administrative state. And more and more of these companies that exert power over the, the economy have this flavor to them. And I think this binary view is not useful anymore. Well, let's real quick do a, a, a big definition of the administrative state, because I think a lot of people have been listening, watching the show know that's a, that's a theme. But we really need to say what it is. I mean, the, the Constitution came up with this notion of the the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch. And right. I guess we had the fourth estate, which was the press. But now what's happened is Congress has delegated so much power right. to the administration, to all the agencies, whether it's the SEC or the the Fed or, or, or Commerce Department or whatever, that now instead of laws coming out of, uh, and, and, and Professor, correct me if I'm not getting this right, now, instead of the laws coming out of Congress, the regulations disguised or laws disguised as regulations are coming out of these agencies. Is that the administrative state? Yeah, I would I would go even 
further. Um, okay. And, you know, so as you said, we've got legislative, we've got executive, and we've got judicial. Um, it's possible, you know, there is something called administrative law, right, that is theoretically possible to, uh, uh, to be consistent with the rule of law, right, where the government actually does follow some regularized procedures for making uh, um, administrative uh, um, regulations um, and, and the like. And interestingly enough, the modern discussion over the rule of law, uh, originally with A.V. Dicey in Britain, who um, wrote his book in the late 19th century on the rule of law specifically to address the need for the rule of law to apply to the, admin to the administrative law that was being created at the time. What we see today, and what I would consider to be administrative state, essentially bears no resemblance to law in any meaningful sense, right? Which is what we see going on in the financial system, what we see going on more and more is not anything that looks like regularized law of promulgation of regulations, notice and comment rulemaking, where they seriously take critiques uh, um, seriously and do it. What it is, is this process of what Wayne Cruz, I like his, uh, from a uh, uh, competitive enterprise institute calls it regulatory dark matter, uh, <laughs> which is the stuff that's not really even law, but has, everybody knows the binding effect of law. So that's the guidances and the supervision and the dear colleague letters. If you remember that one from, uh, from the department of education during the Obama administration, or as John Allison calls it, the regulation by raised eyebrow, uh, which is, do you really need to uh, to do that? Or the, the threats or the cajoling and all this sort of stuff, which is all backed by the threat of, uh, of government action or government inaction, uh, which is so many times now you just need government permission to be able to do something for a merger or a permit or whatever the case may be. And the government can just, you know, passively, aggressively um, uh, punish you. I mean, we we know, for example, there's, you know, situations and when there's new financial regulations come out and no bank will be willing, even though it costs them a lot of money, no bank's willing to challenge it. Why? Because they're afraid of retribution from their regulators, which is, of course, illegal, but everybody knows uh, uh, that, that it happens across the economy. And so when I talk about the administrative state, that's what I'm talking about is the, the, the they've got their fingers in everything, right? And it's the soft power it's this power beyond law that I talk about in my uh, my article about how we need to start taking this seriously and thinking about how we tame this. Well, and they're also sneaky yep. because you've read about this. I think it was, I'm, gonna, I'm getting into geek land, UDAAP, which is Unfair, <laughs> Deceptive, and Abusive Practices. Right. And that's code for disparate impact people, you know, you know, they just sort of arbitrarily decide you can't do this, but, or you can, depending on whether you're in a favorite group. And didn't somebody sneak this into a 2,000-page supervision and examination manual? This is exactly right, Bill. This I mean, is didn't, the, this, didn't this like Exhibit A for what you're talking exactly. about? Exactly. This is this is the class. This is a great well, example. Let me let me just hold it. This is Bill Walton show. I'm with Todd Zawicki. Uh, professor of uh, George Mason, soon to be an anti-progressive in, in Boulder. Um, <laughs> and we're talking about the administrative state and, and really how sneaky they are and how you, we really ought to be aware of what they're up to and pay a lot more attention than we are. Yeah. And this is a, this is a great example of what you're saying, Bill, which is um, this is uh, something that came from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And uh, we have on the books something called the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which has been law for a very long time, that um, provides rules and standards to prohibit um, uh, discrimination against uh, protected classes with respect to the grant of credit. Um, and, you know, that's been what it's uh, been for a long time. We also have, um, for many, many years, something called the Unfair and Deceptive Acts and Practices uh, from the FTC and other regulators have had this. Um, and never before in the decades in which these two things have existed if we thought that unfair deceptive acts and practices includes all the discrimination stuff that we see in ECOA. And so what the CFPB has conjured up uh, is this idea that, in fact, UDAP, they, you know, which is basically the same just with the abusive as well, they because they're pro promulgating this under the unfairness prong, um, UDAP actually prohibits discrimination in any financial 
uh, anything related to financial services. So you have more overdraft protections for one category, you know, more overdraft charges for one category of people than another. It takes longer to the answer the phone or, you know, whatever the, whatever the case may be could potentially be this. Now, there's no way this could survive scrutiny under a standard sort of notice and comment rulemaking, uh, right? There's no basis for it. So there's no legal basis for it. There's no factual findings to support it, uh, anything like that. So they if it goes through the regular process of law. It would never survive. It, it would take years and it would never. <laughs> that's it, our headline here. That's is right. it rule yeah. of law or is it not? Yeah, yeah, right. It would. There's no way a court would uphold this, uh, given this history that I described about it's clear that, that, that this doesn't cover this. So they didn't decide to use notice and comment rulemaking. They could try to do an enforcement action, but of course, if you do an enforcement action, then you have due process protections. You could challenge it in court. They would almost certainly get a stay, you know, whichever it was enforced against uh, for, for the same reason. So what did the CFPB do? They've got this massive examination manual that's supposed to be just, here's how to comply with the law. They changed one paragraph in the examination manual to say from now on, unfair deceptive act and practices includes this, uh, th this activity. Now, here's why this is so nefarious, Bill. This is why this is it's the seemingly trivial thing is so important because this is a model that the Biden administration has used across the administrative state, which is under their argument, the CFPB's argument, providing supervision is just good advice. Here's how you can comply with the law. And so they say, that's not a final agency action. We haven't made you do anything. You can't challenge that. So you can't litigate. You can't litigate it, right? Because they say it's just advice. Wow. Right. It's very much like we're seeing with the Twitter files. Wow, is right? that Orwellian? Yeah, right, exactly. And so they say you can't challenge it until we actually take an action, right? Uh, and so, but everybody knows because of the way the regulatory state works, you know, and we'll talk about this more, is everybody understands that is really, that, that, that's really binding on a bank, right? A bank doesn't want to get crosswise with its uh, supervisors, right? They don't want to be to have this regulation by a raised eyebrow because that just leads to more and more, uh, well, more pain. Think, think so it effectively forces them to comply, even though technically they're not required to comply. Well, let's 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 spend a moment there about the the banker and the regulators. It used to be the banker was up in Peoria, and the regulators are up in Chicago, and the re regulators would come down every three months or six months for a few days for an examination, they talk and things like that. Now though, particularly with the big banks, the regulators are on site full time. That's right. They've got offices, they've got conference rooms, they've got right. probably their own their own cafeteria. I don't know, but no, they, but it's a, they're, they're interrelated. So if you're a banker and you're sitting with the regulator and the regulator says, well, I know it's not in the law, but you, you understand how this works, right. don't you? Right, <laughs> right. No, that's that's exactly right. In in the history of supervision, there's a reason why we have this this supervisory or examination process, and it really goes back to deposit insurance. Um, and the logic of the, and so this is why they call prudential regulation. You know, deposit insurance. Uh, you know, love it or hate it. The logic of deposit insurance is to protect uh, to protect uh, depositors, right? But that creates a moral hazard problem for the banks that the banks now can uh, keep the upside and externalize the downside because most depositors won't pay attention to what's going on. So in exchange for the government privilege of deposit insurance, you have to subject yourself to examination to make sure you're not taking reckless risks, right? That is expanded now to cover all of this social agenda and all the kind of stuff that, uh, that we see in this, uh, the, this manual to things that supervisors, examiners subjectively Thing create risks to you, such as vague reputation risks. Well, let's do history. Let's do a historical lesson, because I think all of us, you know, and I, when I came to the industry, I was sort of in this category. I sort of assumed that deposit insurance and regulators and doing what they're doing, they've been around forever. Well, they haven't been. And they've only been around since the 30s. Right. Deposit insurance was when, 1932? Uh, around there, yeah, right. And before then, if you were a customer of a bank, before you'd put your money in that bank, you wanted to make sure that bank had capital, that bank had reputable people. They, they were ready to protect your money and get your money back to you if you needed it. Right. 
so the market supervised the banks. Right. And then after in the Great Depression, they declared in their wisdom, well, no, they had to protect depositors, so they did the deposit insurance, which was, I think, restored a lot of faith in the system. Right. But the trade was, they said, okay, well, the regulators are now going to determine whether <laughs> banks are safe. Correct. And so they put all the, all, the, all the power and all the oversight in the hands of the regulators, and those of us just going around putting money in banks are supposed to trust the regulators to uh, oversee it. And since then... We've had banking crisis after banking crisis <laughs> after banking crisis. <laughs> That's right. And in the case of uh, Silicon Valley, they the regulators had been in there a few weeks before, and they said, this bank is great. It's in perfect shape. There's no risk right. here. Their right. client compliance is great. Their diversity, equity, and inclusion. They've got yeah. five people <laughs> in that department. <laughs> That's but right. what they forgot to do is they forgot to look at the balance sheet and the right. interest rate risk. So anybody counting on the regulators in the case of Silicon, Silicon Valley Bank, um, well, on the other hand, then they didn't care about the deposit insurance there, did they? Anyway, amplifying that story, I don't want to steal all the... No, that, that, that's right, right? Which is, uh, um, it goes, but, you know, the Fed was uh, early in the 20th uh, uh, century. And then um, during the Great Depression, we get this whole system of deposit insurance. And you described it perfectly, right? Which is deposit insurance... Um, First, let me say, I understand the logic of deposit insurance. Um, depositors are, you know, it's very complex. Uh, financial system is very complex. Depositors are going to have trouble monitoring. Um, there are free rider problems uh, and the like. Uh, but deposit insurance, like any form of insurance, brings what economists call the moral hazard problem, right? Uh, which is, if you have insurance, you might ask, act a little more recklessly, right? Um, and if you're a bank, the concern is um, if you uh, aren't being monitored by your creditors, you might uh, act more recklessly. Now, as you said, the traditional approach to that is pretty straightforward, which is banks just held a lot of capital. Uh, they held capital reserves, uh, right, uh, um, to to make sure that they could make their uh, creditors whole. Um, what happens after you get deposit insurance is now banks reduce the amount of capital they have to hold because depositors don't uh, insist on it. And the whole banking system becomes more unstable. Right. Because now you've reduced the amount of, uh, of uh, capital. Now you layer on top of this the problem you described, which is central planning, which is now the regulators are dictating what they think is risk. Right. Um, and, you know, God bless the federal regulators. But um, but the people who are working as a low level empl employee and a federal bureaucracy, um, you know, are they better than the people who are uh, running banks and understanding what risk is and understanding what best serves their customers uh, and the like? And so, as, as you described, what we've seen since then is this, we've actually seen more instability in the financial system um, going back, this, you know, going back to the savings and loan crisis, uh, going back to the 2008 financial crisis. And I think over and over again, what we've seen is a lot of this is created by the regulatory structure itself uh, for reasons, you know, I talk about in the uh, in the paper. But I think one of my favorite lines from the debate over Dodd-Frank was when Congressman Jeb Henserling said, there are at least three unintended consequences <laughs> on every page of this 2,400 page uh, piece of legislation. So. Well, and then he went to work in a big bank. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's, but that was a good move for him, I think, personally. That, well, you know, right. the thing about banks is that you think about a depositor, you know, big banks in particular are unanalyzable. I mean, you right. can't really look at their balance sheet or their financial statements. I don't care how much disclosure you've got. You really, you really, they're impenetrable even for somebody who's trained in finance. That's right. That's and, right. and I'm not even sure the CEOs of the big banks understand their own balance sheet. I mean, it's just, it's almost humanly impossible to do it. They're, they're so complex and so opaque. That's exactly right. And we saw this coming out of the financial crisis some of the reports of board of directors, for example, oh, no. and senior officials with, with trying to even ha have a clue as to what was going on down, you know, on the 42nd floor where, you know, where the guys on the 39th floor were selling subprime loans indirectly to the guys on the 42nd floor, right? <laughs> and nobody, <laughs> nobody knew what was going on, right? And the whole thing blew up. So, well, anyway, this is Bill Walton. I'm here with Todd Zawicki, who is uh, our... Um, resident guru in all things financial and regulatory, and delighted to have you here. We're just, though, trying to get to the rule of law and how it's 
come unmoored in, in, in finance? And we've described a lot of problems. I mean, is there, is there a remedy? I mean, can we step back? I mean, it, it seems, you, you pointed out in your article, it seems to me like Congress ought to reclaim its powers is, is one of the big remedies. I mean, what do you... Yeah, and so here's, so there's, there's two big questions, right, which is one of us to do about it. But first, I, I just want to amplify something we talked about earlier, which is this is important because the, the, in many ways, the financial citizens, the apotheosis of the regulatory state. And again, what I mean by that is this thick blanket of complex regulation um, of sort of exchanging government favors uh, for government interference. Um, you know, until I kind of started looking at this, I was always confused as to why the Senate traditionally had the Senate um, Committee on Banking and ho Housing and Urban Development. And I always thought to myself, what does banking have to do with housing and urban development? Well, now we know, which is, it's sort of the unholy alliance uh, that we saw during 2008, which is that banks are basically expected to be off balance sheet slush funds for politicians uh, and the like to do things like subsidize the housing market, uh, which went so well in the run up to, uh, to, to 2008, right? So we've seen this intertangling of politics uh, with the financial system. We see this discussion we've been having about supervision and the regulatory dark matter of um, the various ways in which the government can exert its power without ever writing anything down, uh, for example, because banking is so heavily regulated and so entangled with these, uh, th these, these regulators. But it's just the prototype, right? This is the model that the progressives are using to, to, to do the same thing, to basically evade the rule of law, to evade things like transparency, notice and comment, rulemaking, uh, in, in, in the like. And so this is why I think because it's the leverage point, both economically and as a political agenda, it's particularly important to think about how we can try to, in some way or another, constrain this. Your article is a really great overview of this. We talked about the 2,000-page manual that they slipped something into. They're also using doing something obscure called the Basel Capital Right. requirements. And just to back up, Europe has got some, I guess, Basel's in Switzerland, and uh, that's where all the bankers are. And they've got capital, they've, in, in, the European Union has capital requirements, and they say for this type of loan or this type of asset, or, or, or you need to hold these amount of capital against it. And it's really pernicious because they've de declared that loans to countries, right, don't require any capital at <laughs> right, all because right. countries are risk-free. Right. And so consequently, European banks have got like 75% of their loans to countries. Right. And I'd argue the countries are riskier than a lot of multinationals, whereas the United States, about 25%, I think, is, 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 right. is, is, is government loans. But, the, but what they're doing is they're shifting capital requirements, so they're saying fossil fuels. Right. If you've got loans to the fossil fuel industry... You're, you're, what, what are they doing there? Yeah, this is, this shows you, um, I was, I was smirking as you were talking because it always just amused me that Greek bonds and German bonds are <laughs> treated Greek the same. Greek bonds are yeah, the same right. risk. Greek bonds and German bonds oh, yeah. are treated the same it in terms of their, the their, their, their riskiness. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. But obviously, uh, you know, this is the, the danger of central planning, right? Which is if you're going to try to fix prices of bonds, um, and you're dealing with a profit maximizing sector, people are going to buy Greek bonds because they're cheaper if they can count the same as um, the same as is um, uh, is German bonds. But to your larger point, I think, you know, about Basel Capital uh, and the like, and we see this not just in banking, but also in the Securities and Exchange Commission rules involving um, climate change risk. This is just a marvelous example um, of the nefarious of the regulatory nefariousness of the regulatory state in action. So here's here's what they do, right? Which is they say basically you have to hold an appropriate amount of uh, capital for any risk. Now, what does risk involve? It involves economic risk, but what else does it involve? Political, what they call political and transition risk. So what this says is 
the way they basically gin this up is they say, well, you know, there's always a risk out there that the government's going to do something stupid and ridiculous when it comes to fossil fuels, right? Like they're going to just ban fossil fuels or, or something like that, right? Well, that's an actual risk. It's an actual risk, right? That's what I'm saying. It's an actual <laughs> risk that the government will do something insane like trying to ban fossil fuels. Yeah. So all they say is, well, the, the fact that the government might do that then the government's it, telling you you need to hold then more capital. That makes investments in fossil fuels riskier. Oh so you have to have more capital against <laughs> the fact we're going to make you, uh, so if you're in the financial regulators, they're going to make you hold more capital because those lunatics over there in the environmental group might uh, uh, force you uh, to, 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 you know, to, to destroy the value of these, uh, these investments. And so, um, and so voila, what have you done? You've raised the cost of providing capital to, to capital to the um, financial industry without the government actually doing anything, right? That's the thing, is you don't have to actually do anything. The financial regulators just have to decide this is an elevated risk. So you'll remember um, that this kind of disappeared without a trace, but you remember uh, President Biden's first nominee for the Office of the Comptroller of Currency. The Comptroller was Who can this forget woman, Saleh Amarova. I can't pronounce right? her name. You pronounce her name. Saleh Amarova, okay. right? And do you remember what got her tripped up? Was she had said, we should use the financial system to bankrupt the fossil fuels industry. And this is exactly how they would do it. Completely non-transparent to the rest of the world is all they have to do is flip a little dial. The, the regulators just have to flip a little dial that says this type of uh, investment in fossil fuels is much riskier than this type of investment in alternative energy, right? And all of a sudden, what have you done? You've created incentives to shift investment away from fossil fuels um, to uh, uh, renewable energy and the like. And you've basically accomplished your goals without ever passing a regulation. And that's completely, almost every American is oblivious to the way that that process can work. And if they're work. writing risk disclosures, and I've been through this with lots of prospectus, if they're intellectually honest, they would say, Green energy, alternative energy, is very risky. Right. Because it depends on government subsidies. Right. And guess what? The trillion dollars of government subsidies might run out someday because we can't afford it. Right. So you've got risks in that that they're not forcing you to disclose. Right. But they are in this bizarro world of, of risk, well, they might put fossil fuels out of business, which is what they're trying That's to right. do. That's right. And the Securities Exchange Commission, this proposal they have uh, for disclosures on so-called climate risk includes the same thing. Well, this is Gary Gensler, SEC, right. once again, arbitrary. He he runs the SEC, he's the chairman. He, I guess I understand that the chairman has a massive staff. Right. And the other four commissioners have like a secretary. That basically, yeah, right. right. And so he runs everything. He, he runs it's everything, arbitrary right. by fiat. And he declared that companies were going to have to disclose massive amounts of climate risk. Right. Uh, including these so-called transition risks, right? And the point is, um, under the securities you know, exchange laws, you're only supposed to uh, um, disclose risks that are, are material to the financial condition of the company. Um, clearly, none of this is material to the financial condition of the, uh, the company. Clearly what it is, is designed to be a way of forcing um, companies to basically disclose information that uh, activists uh, can use against them um, and allow them to get act, you know, action to this and basically browbeat them and use informal pressure to basically um, to, uh, to, to do this. And just again, raise the cost of, um, of uh, dealing with traditional um, uh, energy and sort of shift to, uh, to, to other things that are more politically favored. So we, I, wanted, I want to shift gears. I want to get into central bank digital currency right. because that, to me, is the biggest single thing looming on the horizon. But before we jump into that, how would you, for those, I mean, I'm, I'm more deeply in this wonk stuff, as are you, but, but for somebody that's not really a, a finance uh, uh, professional or somebody in the industry, how would you frame how people ought to be thinking about this and what they ought to be telling their congressmen to do? Yeah, great question. I was uh, uh, thinking about this, how to, how to sum this up. Uh, um, um, you know, back, um, you know the, back, back during the socialist communist planning days, right, the idea was is that the central planners of the government would get a hold of the so-called commanding heights of the economy, uh, you know, which were steel, 
uh, telecommunications, energy, and the like. Well, nowadays, the commanding heights of the economy are finance um, and social media, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we see here, for the way to people to think about this is um, that finance, um, more than anything else, is the centrality of our lives, right? Uh, which is you can't have a business uh, without a bank account. You basically can't live without a bank account, uh, right? And so the and so what the progressives have come to understand is you can use this access to the financial system as a lever, not just to infringe on people's ability to bank, but infringe on their ability to live, right? And so if you can take somebody's bank account away and basically put them on, if you've listened to the tape of uh, Mike Lindell, who you mentioned earlier, where the bank tells Lindell, we don't want to have to put you on that tape. right. We don't want to have to put you on the bad boy list. Do you remember that? He said, you know, you can you ba basically what they said to Lindell is, look, you got two options. You can voluntarily close your bank account, or we will close your bank account in, 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 in involuntarily. And if we close your bank involuntarily, we'll put you on the quote bad boy list which is not quite clear what that is, although I think I know what it is. And then that means you're not going to get a bank account anywhere else, right? And so to say he voluntarily closed his bank account at that point is, you know, silly to say, right? But that's that's the sort of Damocles, right? That's exactly what the social media companies like Twitter did to people with the first strike and the second strike and the third strike, right? Which is that what they want to do is chill you from expressing certain opinions um, uh, and the like. And so that's the sense of what you say, this is the commanding heights now, which is getting the, your fingers into the financial system allows you to control every part of people's lives now, uh, potentially, through debanking them. So we talked about by controlling the flow of capital um, uh, and the like. And you know, I give the example, which is not fanciful, right? I give the example in the paper of, um, the Canadian truckers, if you remember them, when they were protesting and Trudeau seized their, froze their bank accounts. Um, and then they switched to cryptocurrencies and they froze their uh, cryptocurrency wallets and tried to, uh, to, 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 to steal it. Uh, why? Because they said that they were all involved in basically a conspiracy to break the law through sitting their trucks there and honking their horns too much. Well, think of it this way, Bill, which is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference led by Martin Luther King in the 1960s, were doing the exact same thing as the truckers, right? They were accused at the time, and this is why they were arrested as part of their, uh, uh, their, their protest. They were accused of basically engaging in a conspiracy to engage in trespassing, disturbing the peace, right? Those sorts of things. Now, imagine if the regulators at the time had said, we're not going to allow people to donate money to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference anymore because they're using this to engage in a uh, conspiracy to, uh, to, to break the law intentionally. We're not going to allow you to use, uh, as they did with one of the leaders of the Canadian truckers, yeah, you have a right to bail in this country, but you don't have a right to access your bank account to post bail, right? Because, you know, that's ill-gotten uh, ill money, right? So you can have a right to bail, but if you can't post bail, um, what, what good is it, right? And this is why it seems conspiratorial. It seems crazy to think that banking is so important to this and finance is so important to this. But this is why I think it, it is really the linchpin of everything we think of as being able to live as free people, um, not just economically, but to express our opinions um, and everything else. Cryptocurrency. Somebody was saying to me, well, that couldn't happen and I said, well, it did happen in Canada. <laughs> How did they get away with that? Some of them said, well, the crypto is away from the government. I don't think crypto is all that away from the government. No, that's what they said, right? And so I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I, I was not, unfortunately, I was not surprised by what happened. And um, a lot of our libertarian friends had been telling me the same thing, and I was always skeptical. So let me tell you why my skepticism was warranted. Again, because of the way the modern administrative state works. So the logic is that, Crypto is anonymous, all right? Uh, um, and so the idea would be you're outside the banking system. Um, your crypto wallets are basically anonymous. You have to have this uh, um, these numbers to, to unlock it, right? Mm -hmm. But the key is, is you essentially still have to have something like a crypto bank or crypto wallet. Why? Because 
the Kroger and the Harris Teeter still aren't taking cryptocurrency, right? So if you want to buy groceries or pay your rent or whatever, at some point you have to convert your money from crypto back into dollars, right? Or pay your bail, uh, for example. And so their view was it was all anonymous and these things. And so nobody would know who had what. But what the Canadian government did is exactly, exactly what I predicted they would do. They would say, we don't know who those wallets are. You don't know whose wallets are, but here's what they said. They said, from now on, we are gonna make you, the crypto uh, company, responsible for knowing whose wallet it is, right? Hmm. And it will be a violation of the law in and of itself for you to have uh, um, um, clients that you don't know who they are, right? And so basically what they're doing is extending the principle of anti-money laundering laws and the like, and basically putting the onus on the company to force you as a condition of business to reveal yourself, right? And so this is why the libertarians who are sort of crypto utopians have missed the point because they don't understand how the regulatory state works, which is we, not, may, we may not be able to figure out who it is directly, but we can force you under the threat of, 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 of imprisonment and tell you, if you deal with people and you don't know who they are, then you are the one who is in, a, in a hot water. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So that's how you create a regulatory crime uh, out of thin air, right? Um, and what we're seeing now in the United States, it's been called now Operation Choke Point 2.0, right? We talked about Operation Choke Point under Obama, which targeted payday lenders and the like. But there's reports now about Operation Choke Point 2.0 which is crypto companies are being debanked. I have a colleague who is going to start a little nonprofit research organization uh, to study cryptocurrency. He has been turned down by six banks to create a, 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 um, a, a bank account for his little research organization because it contains the word crypto in the title mm -hmm. <laughs> of, the, uh, of the thing. Now, why, why is crypto the new target of the left? It's for exactly what what you're saying, which is they want to get a hold of crypto, they want to control it, and it to the, the extent they can. So here, here we'll illustrate the point. You know, Rashida Tlaib, uh, the congresswoman who's one of the squad, along with um, uh, AOC and those, you know what the first bill she proposed when she came to Congress was? A bill that would require cryptocurrency to be uh, in stable coins to be within the banking system. If she claimed it was protect consumers, we don't know what that is, is they want to sweep cryptocurrency into the banking system precisely so that they can Isn't control it. Isn't it interesting how the squads become part of the deep state so rapidly? <laughs> I mean, there's no more deep state notion than that. Now you got AOC defending uh, Hunter Biden. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really... Um, it's, well, uh, you know, they've, they've, uh, they've discovered that the deep state and the administrative state is their ally. Oh, yeah. Well, let's do one big last... A hurrah on deep state issues. Um, it was, it's Todd Zwicky. I'm Bill Walden. I'm with Todd Zwicky, and we're talking about uh, all things financial and why we need to be concerned about the government uh, and our money. Uh, in particular, right now, August tw 2023, we very much need to be concerned about the Fed's plans, and they're rolling it out as we speak, uh, for central bank digital currency. And this is the one thing. This would be a game changer if that thing rolls into into place. Uh, it would give them pretty much complete control over all of our over all of our spending. Uh, and the SEC has a similar plan on yeah. disclosure of our of our of our investable assets and all our assets, in fact. And so, talk about the totalitarian. The end game is through the banking system and through our the 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 investment uh, uh, portfolios we have. But you mentioned something. In your piece, and, and by the way, where can we find the piece? We're going to have it on our uh, website. The Heritage Historian. Foundation. Uh, okay, First so on Heritage. Yeah, at the but Heritage we'll Foundation. have it on our site, and mm -hmm. it'll be, um, it, you can link it and find it. It only takes about 45 minutes to read. You'll know a lot you feel like you should have already known after you've read it. I did. Um, but you threw a word in there, central bank digital currency, programmable. Yeah. What's that mean? Yeah, and so programmable uh, central bank digital currency would 
allow them to, um, uh, you know, it's just bits, right? It's just stuff that appears in your bank account um, electronically. So also my bank's now not at PNC. My bank is the Federal Bank, Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. So it could be that you get it directly through the uh, through the uh, um, through the Fed, which is one of the proposals, or it could be that you you said that it is intermediated through through a private bank. Right. Okay. But basically, the way it works is think about, for example, food stamps, right? Food stamps can only be spent on certain goods, right? Um, that they're in that sense, they're analog, but they're programmable in some sense. What they could do is they could give you central bank digital currency instead of real dollars and say you can only spend it on this, that, or the other, right? So they could say you can only um, spend so many credits on. Um, gas this month because you've exhausted your fossil fuel um, um, amount, right? You could program it that says, we're going to say that uh, um, you can, this certain amount of money can only be spent on minority-owned businesses. So that, so that little flag on the tank at the, at the pump at the gas station, which limits your spending to $100, yeah. <laughs> became archaic, you know, during Joe Biden's run-up and uh, right. gasoline prices. That would be in your credit card. Yeah. So right. it's not just a limit at the gas pump, but that be in your credit card. Where that, this month right. you spent six hundred dollars on gasoline. Right. That's way too much. Right. So you can monitor people's carbon. You could limit through, their, the, right. through how much they spend on gas. That's right. Gas or the kind of things they uh, uh, spend it on. Right. You could control if you thought they were. Uh, you know, the government has a way of leaking information pretty readily now. So if you spent money on the wrong sort of reading materials. Uh, I mean, or you, you can couldn't, imagine all or that. you couldn't spend money at a cake shop that refused to bake cakes for a gay wedding. That's right. For example, right. So you couldn't use your money there. That's right. That's right. So and, you can put them out of business. Yeah, you know, and it's funny, Bill. I mean, I kind of came to this after following the um, the debanking. De <laughs> I mean, and you, it you, sounds, you're talking about something. It sounds like a, you know, you know, the, the joke now is right. What's the difference between a conspiracy theory and reality? About three months, right? Well, you said um, and, that eight months ago, and yeah, now right. nine things have happened since your last <laughs> That's year. right. That's okay. right. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I think that, that, the, that the lesson here is, is that, you know, now that the, we don't have the rule of law, right? We do not have anything. We don't have the rule of law here anymore, right? And so I think what that means is we must always be wary of the principle, right? The small incursion, we must always be wary of the principle. Now, I say that from looking at the financial what system. Be, what do you mean be wary of the principle? What that, does that mean? That if, 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 basically, if you give the government an inch, we should assume they'll take a mile, right? That if you allow a small exception, the, the exception will expand, right? They've done this with social media, right? They took the small exception for, uh, you know, violence and harassment and that sort of thing, and then turned it in this misinformation thing, right? Um, that's what they do here, right? And I say this both from, say, the financial system, but also I haven't been a professor for 25 years, right? Everything we're seeing going on in society, we saw this 20 years ago in academia, and everybody said, oh, that's just academia. That's not going to happen anywhere else. And it did, right? The principle, the small principle embedded in this small little idea will expand. And so I think what we have to accept is if you think that the government should be able to freeze people's bank accounts because they don't like the Canadian truckers, we should assume that's going to just become a general power that they can uh, that they can wield, right? And keep in mind, as a reporter, sixty five percent of American Democrats agreed with Justin Trudeau's action in freezing uh, freezing the uh, freezing those bank accounts, right? And so, so the point here is, it, it seems kind of crazy, but I think we need to be aware that this is why these people want central bank digital currency so much, right? Which is they claim that they want to be able to control traffic, you know, drugs, human trafficking, all that sort of stuff. More power to them, right? That, 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 that's bad stuff, right? But here's the problem is that that's always the camel's nose under the tent, right? Operation Choke Point was justified by the fact that, well, we're just trying to prevent fraud. It went from preventing fraud to preventing payday lending in, uh, um, in, in gun shops, right? Um, here, you can justify CBDC. And this is why I say you've got to be aware of the principle, which is I think it would be a great thing if we had some way of controlling human trafficking, 
illegal activity, money laundering, and that sort of thing. In a world where we had the rule of law and we could trust our regulators to limit it to that discretionary power, that would be a good power, that would be a good thing to have. But in the world we live in now, I think it's naive to believe that if we grant them that power for that limited purpose, that it's going to stay reserved to that power. And a lot of people point out that there is no legal authority for the Federal Reserve to do this. And I think what, the, what, the, what they've shown again and again and again over recent decades is they're not sitting around waiting for legal authority, right? They just do it, and after it's a fait accompli, it never gets undone. Well, the, you, so the remedy is to get Congress to prohibit it. Uh, yes. How that are you going to do that yeah, through so the that Senate? Would, How are we going to get right. uh, Joe Biden to sign that into law? Right. So I think that's so. So that I think so is this a more ought general, to be a campaign issue in the 2024 presidential campaign. That's if right. we have enough time. Yeah. And uh, Ron DeSantis has, in fact, put this proposal out there, right, to formally ban central bank digital currency. I think he may have actually banned it in, in Florida. But this is the point, And it takes all the way back to where we started, right, yeah. Bill, which is um, the rule of law and the public private distinction, which is a lot of people say, well, we don't need to worry about central bank digital currency because. The Fed, we, we, the Fed doesn't have that power granted to it, right? But that's not the way the regulatory start works, this day, it works these days, right? Which is, you know, basically it expands to fill the void. So unless it's specifically prohibited, they're going to act as if it's permitted, right? And that's what we see over and over again, which is unless it's specifically prohibited, we should act like it's, uh, they'll act like it's permitted. So whether it's specifically banning central bank digital currency so that they can be sued immediately if they do it. Whether, as I argue, the fair access to financial services rule that um, Brian Brooks issued um, uh, from the Office of the Control of the Currency, which would affirmatively prohibit uh, discrimination in bank accounts based on political views or affirmatively prohibit discrimination against fossil fuel companies and the like. I think what we have to actually realize is that the administrative state has slipped its leash, that simply de uh, not granting a power is not enough. I think we need to more and more dictate um, uh, limits on its power, prohibitions on the power of our regulators, not just assume that if we don't grant them the power, they won't act. So the big issue, the big takeaway is we need to be mindful that the administrative state can do all this stuff and instead of just passively sort of writing papers or you know, giving speeches, we need to get Cong Congress to act with specific laws prohibiting this. That's that's my view. Okay. And uh, that's, you know, a, a peculiar position, uh, I admit, for Why is that peculiar? Well, to, uh, to, uh, to, to impose... For somebody who writes papers, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, to call, for more paper. to call for more government laws. Right? Well, yeah, uh, but you, uh, you, know, you got to play the game. You, we got to play the game as it exists. That, that's right. And this is exactly right, Bill, which is the, in the world of the first best, we would live in the world with the rule of law. Yeah. We don't live in that world. And so we are in the world of the second best. And so pretending like we still live in the world of the first best, I think is just naive, um, you know, and so Precisely. I think we, I think we need to take markets yeah. and the and politics, the way they are in the real world and actually deal with that reality rather than pretending like we still live in the 18th century world of, uh, Adam Smith and David Hume, um, and pretending like there's these easy solutions to these problems. Okay, Todd, this is great. Todd Zawicki, uh, now with, uh, Scalia School of Law, soon to be Boulder, uh, University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, I, I think I want to come sign up for your class on uh, both the rule of law and for Hayek. Uh, it's going to be a, <laughs> it's going to be an entertaining uh, semester. I'm I'm envious of the students out there. Anyway, thanks, and uh, I may bring in via Zoom at some point as we get an emergency situation on this CBDC. This has been the Bill Walton Show. Todd's Wiki's my. Favorite, one of my favorite guests back uh, talking about the administrative state and finance, et cetera. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, even though a lot of what we talked about was alarming, it's stuff we need to know about and be lining up uh, lines of action to do something about it. Uh, as always, you can find the show on all the major podcast platforms and on Rumble and on YouTube and Substack on CPAC Now on Monday night. Uh, 
We're starting up something new called Insider Access Live, which is where I'll be doing a Zoom show with uh, anybody who would like to sign up and participate. And it'll be, I think, a fairly lively Q&A about this topic and all the other topics we've, uh, we've covered in the show. And uh, you can find that on our website, uh, simple form, fill it out, email address. We'll send you some notifications and hopefully you will join us. So thanks for, thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll be back. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.